Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our first um, public event in Ethica Labs uh, program. Um, we are very delighted that today we have um, our guest, Inke Arns, from um, Kartwein Media Kunstverein in Dortmund, uh, who we invited to share with us their latest exhibition uh, entitled House of Mirrors, Artificial Intelligence as Phantasm. As you can see from the title, uh, it's very close to what we are uh, exploring in, um, in the um, uh, process of uh, Ethica Labs, uh, which started actually a year ago uh, as a joint project by six Goethe Institutes in Southeast Europe, among which the Goethe Institutes in Athens, Bucharest, Ankara, Sarajevo, Sofia and Zagreb. And the project goal is to open a cross-genre space for critical conversation on AI and ethics in the region. Uh, and the second round of the project combines online and offline activities, including a three-day uh, in-person idiot on Sofia that happened in the end of May, uh, three uh, online workshops, and series of open to the public uh, online events, which we start today with this talk. Uh, and first of all, before to give the floor to Inke, I would like to invite uh, Bettina Wenzel, who is part of the project team, to welcome the audience. Yeah, hi everybody out there. So as Galia said, I'm Bettina Wenzel. I'm the head of information for South Eastern Europe at the Goethe Institute in Athens. Uh, and I'm very keen what Inke is telling us about her exhibition, and I really would like to see it and to go to Dusseldorf, but but, but, but many reasons, so I have to take that opportunity to get into the exhibition. Um, yeah, for us at the Goethe Institute, it is currently an exciting field to initiate projects at the interface of art, AI, and the humanities. And at our more than 150 institutes worldwide, networks are created, events are conceived, and ethical issues are explored. For example, we have a huge project about AI in Munich called Generation A, they are currently running AI residencies all over Europe, art and AI, a perfect union. It's a question with participants also from all over the world. Um, in London, our colleagues are, um, are discussing in their project uh, the question of uh, AI and text production. So they try to uh, develop a tool that minimizes the bias in texts and strengthen a conscious approach to language. And let's go down under also in Australia, the colleagues there in the Goethe Institute are, um, yeah, have a program, it's called Kulturtechnik 4.0, creating in the age of AI. Uh, yeah, they take a closer look at the interplay between AI and traditional cultural skills. They're inviting key names to discuss and explore our concerns and curiosity about an increasingly AI-driven future. And I think, Inke, that it's also what the topic of your exhibition or a part of that, if I understood well. So you see, uh, AI, Goethe ethics is all around the world and uh, we try to figure out how it uh, influence our lives and our culture and our art. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Bettina. Right, so um, I would like to, um, before to give the floor to Inke Ernst to introduce her shortly. She's, uh, as I mentioned already, director of uh, Hardware Media and Kunstverein in Dortmund in Germany. Uh, she has worked internationally as an independent curator and theorist, specialized in new media, net cultures, and Eastern Europe since 1993. Um, after living in Paris in the period of 1982 to uh, 86, she studied Russian literature, Eastern European studies, political science and art history in Berlin and Amsterdam uh, later on. And in 2004, she received her PhD from the Humboldt University in Berlin. Inke Arns has curated many exhibitions, among them at the Bauhaus de so, in Gallery Exit in Peye, in Kunstwerke, Berlin, in the Museum of uh, Contemporary Art in Belgrade and many, many others. Uh, she is also uh, the author of many articles on contemporary art, media art, and net cultures. And uh, she also edited numerous exhibitions, catalogs, and books. Um, in, 2000, uh, in 
2021-22. She is visiting professor of curatorial practice in the Munster Art Academy. Um, and recently, she is also a curator at the Pavilion of the Republic of Kosovo with artist Jakub Ferry at the 29th Berlin Biennale di Venezia. So um, I am very uh, delighted to invite Inke now to present us uh, the exhibition in, um, in the gallery, uh, House of Mirror. Alina, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm very excited. Uh, you know, everything I hear from this project sounds extremely uh, important and timely and urgent as well, because I think it's very, very important to speak about ethics when you talk about artificial intelligence. And also what Bettina said about all these activities of the Goethe Institute worldwide. I have to admit, I have to look into these activities much more because I think what you just said is is it it's, uh, sounds really, really very interesting, uh, all these activities. So um, maybe to just give a little correction, my institution is not based in Düsseldorf, um, but in another city also starting with D, it's called Dortmund, it's in the Ruhr area. And uh, that's uh, where I'm joining you from right now. Um, I think I will start the presentation uh, by sharing the screen mm. and should be working right now i hope you can yeah okay so um uh, how many people are watching right now do we know this <laughs> you have to switch on your microphone <clears throat> the first 16 people okay cool so I'm looking forward to, uh, to uh, an interesting discussion um, afterwards. So the idea is that I walk you through the exhibition that is currently on view at HMKV, Hardware Media Art Association, uh, which is called House of Mirrors. And this whole, you know, guided tour, which is not really a live guided tour, but I try to make it look like a live guided tour, um, it's going to last about uh, 30 minutes. Um, obviously, I can't speak about all the works, but I will give you a kind of overview and also an understanding of how we structured uh, the exhibition. When I say we, um, I'm not the only curator. We curated this exhibition with uh, three people in total. Um, uh, it's uh, Marie Lech Lechner, Lechner from Paris. Uh, colleague curator with whom I already curated this uh, uh, big exhibition called Computer Girls, um, and um, Francis Hunger from Leipzig, um, with whom we are currently working on a research project called Training the Archive, which is also about artificial intelligence, but how to use artificial intelligence in order to work with archives, with collections. So, you know, as a kind of curatorial assistant or master, you know, uh, that's what we are researching right now in this context. Um, so um, the exhibition House of Mirrors um, is, well, the subtitle is Artificial Intelligence as Phantasm. And uh, with the three of us, Marie, Francis and me, um, when we decided to make this exhibition, we all agreed that we were all quite critical about the notion of artificial intelligence because uh, of obviously it suggests that there's something intelligent about um, this. Um, and we think this is rather not the case or this might be misleading. Uh, and uh, the three of us, we really prefer to talk about pattern recognition because artificial intelligence really is about pattern recognition. Um, and these patterns are not recognized, you know, uh, per se, but some, somebody, someone has to train uh, the algorithms, you know, in order to recognize, be able to recognize those patterns. And this is where it gets tricky. So first of all, um, we, we decided to call this exhibition a House of Mirrors because um, 
we think that because artificial intelligence is really machine learning and somebody has to train those machines and automatically when you train a machine you will <laughs> almost immediately also train it on your own let's say blank spots or biases or you know things you don't know or are not interested in or things you don't consider part of your bubble for example so you know artificial intelligence for us is rather a kind of house of mirrors where you constantly uh, meet your own reflection but sometimes those reflections are also distorted and maybe you get lost in this house of mirrors but obviously there's only one way through uh, until you get to the exit so that's uh, the explanation of the title um, artificial intelligence as phantasm uh, this is really about you know we have lots of phantasms about artificial intelligence they can be very positive they can be very negative so they can be utopian or dystopian. Um, we see this in, in science fiction movies, for example, where um, artificial intelligence is supposed to take over uh, power uh, or to you know, uh, become a master of the world. Um, we see this also, let's say, more as a positive uh, phantasm in uh, engineers dreams you know where everything can be automated uh, and we will be free of work so these are really extreme phantasms we have about the fears and also hopes connected to artificial intelligence and so the exhibition is trying to kind of navigate through those uh, extremes let's say okay um as you can see, these are just some views of the exhibition. There are indeed a lot of mirrors. So our scenographers, they really try to turn this exhibition into a house of mirrors, where sometimes you really encounter yourself. And then sometimes the, the space is really um, quite irritating because you see works that are around the corner. And yeah, so um, the exhibition is divided into seven chapters. Um, I leave out the lobby right now, uh, and you know the the you can see each room. Obviously, there's more rooms or more exhibition spaces to the exhibition, but these are more like thematic rooms. Each room is dedicated to uh, one topic. Room number one, obviously, is really a dreamscape of full automation. Um, that's the fantasies of, you know, uh, handing everything over to the machines and uh, having a lot of leisure time um, and so on and so on. I will, I will go through these topics uh, as we proceed through the exhibition. So I don't, we don't uh, spend too much time on this, um, uh, on this uh, slide. So let's first uh, look at this dreamscape of full automation. This is, this is where we start the exhibition and we have a huge work by uh, Pierre Casso Noguez, Stéphane Degoutin and Gwenaud Lavagon, uh, three French artists and um, theorists. Um, it's called Welcome to Yerevan. Um, and I specifically marked here the, the URL because you really should check out this project um, uh, online. Um, it is a uh, it's a, an 11 channel video work um, looking at this phantasm of full automation and what is interesting about this work uh, is that they the artists are using uh, video footage they found on youtube or online so it's not something, it's not images that, they, that depict the future, but really images that depict the present. And in the present, they already find, you know, these dreams of full automation. Um, and um, the, the title of the work, Welcome to Yerevan, is obviously referring to, um, to um, 
uh, a novel from the 19th century, Samuel Butler. He wrote a novel called uh, Yerevan. It's an inversion of nowhere, basically utopia. And in this Yerevan, um, uh, apparently uh, people understood at some point that machines are evolving much faster than human beings and that's when they decided to destroy all the machines so that's in the novel uh, but the artists took this as a point of departure in a way got inspired by this novel and they are now imagining a world where those machines have not been destroyed so this is why they call it welcome to Yerevan here are some more pictures uh, you see on the right hand side you see a dog with uh, virtual reality glasses you see lots of robots taking care of elderly people um, and also people um, enjoying their free time because the machines take over all the work. Another very interesting aspect, as you can see, it's still in the dreamscape of full automation is um, uh, automatic cars or let's say autonomous cars, sorry. Uh, and we invited Nicolas Gouraud, another French artist, um, who made a very interesting video work about uh, so-called VOs. Uh, it's short for vehicle operators. And he's looking into the first case of an autonomous car uh, that killed a woman, that killed a passerby who was crossing the street. Uh, and this, I think it was in 2018, um, this happened, this was an Uber, Uber car. Um, and it happened while the car was being trained. So there was a human driver in the car, but obviously this human driver, uh, uh, she was watching Netflix uh, and uh, did not, was not able to stop the car in time. So um the the woman who crossed the street uh with a bicycle she got killed and so obviously now in with this case um there are questions arising like who is being responsible for uh for this case so is it is it the software programmer uh, is it the company is it the driver so these questions of responsibility become rather complicated. On the right hand side, you see um, you see the world, how the car sees the world. So it works with this uh, leader radar system. The world consists of zillions of little points and it tries to make sense of uh, what it sees. And uh, when you're watching the video, you actually uh, are put in the position of, uh, of this car and its vision of the world. So the second room is looking, it obviously has this uh, <laughs> another French title, <laughs> but it's also referring to uh, Magritte. René Magritte has this famous painting of you know, a pipe where Magritte wrote uh, underneath, this is not a pipe. So um, we are entering um, the field of classification and categorization. So in order for uh, artificial intelligence to be able to recognize patterns, obviously we have to train, we have to train it, you know, it has to learn what are the different categories. And um, these two works by Simon Nikil and uh, by Anna Riddler, they are looking into this um, problem, let's say, <clears throat> because um, uh, Simon, this is Simon Nikil's uh, installation and uh, it's called Sorting Song. And uh, it's like, it sounds like, a, I mean, it's, it's kind of shaped, um, uh, according, it sounds like a children's song um, uh, by which children are learning something. And around the screen, you see those children's chairs. They are very tiny chairs. Um, 
grouped around the video. And in the video, basically, you see lots of objects, you know, going by, passing by. And then um, somebody asking, like, uh, whether this is a chair. And then a whole philosophical uh, discussion evolves around how do we know that a chair is a chair? Obviously, we know that a chair is a chair because not only because of its shape, but also, you know, a lot of contextual information. Um, machines have very strict categories and they cannot, they cannot really take into um, account all this contextual uh, information. So, um, um, for example, you know, um, how do we know that a chair is a chair? Is it by, by its shape or is it by being able to sit on it? And humans really decide on this in a very, let's say, um, flexible and contextual um, situation, whereas machines are not able to do it. And that's why we have to teach them categories and they are very strict and not flexible at all. Um, that's just another view of, um, on the right hand side, you can see how, how small the chairs are. And also um, one of the objects around uh, the projection is a stone because it's being addressed in the video. Maybe a stone is a chair as well, uh, but a machine would not recognize it. Um, Anna Riddler's piece is very different and I'm going to be quite short about it because I'm watching the time. So Anna Riddler is interested in uh, historical encyclopedias and um, we see her using images from historical encyclopedias and, you know, um, putting notions to it, you know, uh, describing what she sees on the image. And it's a really painstaking process, but um, she really um, makes very clear what, what is the precondition for artificial intelligence to work. It's really uh, humans describing images in the case of um, image recognition. Um, and she's making this very interesting link to historical encyclopedias, uh, which are the first, um, let's say, media of uh, classification uh, in that sense. But I, I won't spend more time on this uh, because uh, there's still a lot of rooms <laughs> to follow. Uh, so the third room, there's only one work in the room. It's a room which we called a curiosum with delicately violent machines. And uh, we brought uh, Julien Prévieux with a video. Um, it's called Where is my deep mind? Um, which you can see on the right side. So it is a video uh, where we see four performers. And those performers are trying to imitate machines that are in the process of learning. So uh, the performers are trying to imitate machines that are trying to imitate humans. So, and they obviously also try to reenact those mistakes and then, you know, uh, the learning process of repeating the action and, you know, uh, do not make this, uh, this mistake again. And it's, um, it's a very, I would say, almost philosophical work because what Julien Prévieux is, is, is um, telling us basically is that it's not so much about um, machines, you know, becoming so intelligent, but it's rather about, it's a really a work about us uh, adapting more and more to the behavior of machines in a way. So um, it's a very interesting room um, with one work, which leads the way to room number four, um, which has a very interesting title. It's called The Secret Chamber of Artificial Artificial Intelligence. And this is not a mistake um, because the notion of artificial, artificial intelligence was coined by Amazon and specifically coined 
uh, for its uh, Amazon Mechanical Turk service. This is an online platform where um, micro tasks can be performed uh, in order to receive micro payments. So very little things like describing images or describing emotions. Um, and this is all used in order to train artificial intelligence. Um, so in this category, uh, in this section or in this room, we have um, uh, three, I, I think I even we have uh, no, we have uh, uh, four works, but I'm talking only about three of those works. We have um, RYBN, uh, it's an artist collector from Paris. We have uh, Elisa Giardina Papa from uh, Italy and uh, Lauren Lee McCarthy. The first work I would like to briefly talk about is this very interesting analog installation by RYBN. Um, it's an artist collector from Paris um, who are making extremely interesting work, um, which you should look into. And here it's, it's you can see 12 tables and uh, on the 12 tables, you have different kinds of, you know, screens, analog materials, books, and um, um, you get an audio guide as a visitor, and then you can follow actually the narrative. It's guiding you through those different tables. And they are looking at the history of automation. Uh, let's say the world history of automation, starting with um, uh, this, well, the, the starting point of artificial, artificial intelligence, with, which is the so-called um, Chess Turk, in German it's called Schachtürke by um, uh, von Kempelen. Um, and this was, I think, in the 18th century. Uh, it became really, um, was very popular. Uh, lo lots of people knew about it. It was a chess playing automaton, a supposedly chess playing automaton. And what uh, people obviously did not know is that there was a a person sitting inside the box underneath the chessboard, uh, which was uh, who was moving the, the chess uh, figures. Um, and um, so obviously this is all about, it's in the section of artificial, artificial intelligence. And um, um, this notion of um, fake artificial intelligence uh, basically describes all those situations where you know, it would be too, too expensive maybe to uh, employ artificial intelligence, but also for tasks that artificial intelligence is still not able to do, like um, uh, annotation of images uh, and all these kinds of uh, different um, activities. Um, this is a project by Elisa Jardina Papa. It's called Cleaning Emotional Data. And uh, I also show you, this is uh, taken from the other side. Uh, so this is like the back side. Um, and here you see um, the three monitors um, from the front. Elisa Jardina Papa uh, uh, made a self-test. So she decided to work. Um, I, I, I'm not sure whether she used the, the platform Amazon Mechanical Talk, but she, she became one of those click workers. And, uh, you know, um, defining or describing or annotating emotions uh, and then earning a quarter of a cent for annotating or describing one image. Um, and what, what she had to do, uh, she really had to, you know, um, annotate and describe emotions and pictures she saw, like these uh, three pictures of a human, of a dog and a uh, Bugs Bunny. Um, and uh, obviously when you work in this kind of business, you have to do this really, really quickly. And also this is where lots of, lots of um, mistakes or... Uh, 
uh, yeah, mistakes happen, let's say. Um, she also had to reenact uh, emotional expressions with her own face, which would then later be used to animate um, virtual characters. So um, I'm going to skip Lauren Lee McCarthy's project because this was all about, you know, uh, we all know these digital assistants. Um, when you say Alexa or Siri, they become active and then they do stuff, they switch on the light, they turn on the music. And in this case, in this project, she actually turned herself into one of those digital assistants. So she was a human digital assistant appearing like a digital assistant. People in whose homes she was invited, of course, knew about it. And so this is a very interesting experiment, um, how those people uh, in this ex experiment um, reacted on her um, uh, as a human digital assistant. Because also sometimes when we activate those digital assistants, we don't really know whether it's only machines listening to us constantly, because the machines have to listen constantly until they find the pattern Siri or Alexa, or whether it's humans uh, who also uh, listen in. So uh, let me quickly maybe bring you to the cabinet of eerie laughter. Um, this is works really focusing on bias um, and things connected to, um, to it. Um, two works in this section, um, Libihini and uh, Mushon Zeraviv. Uh, Libihini's work um, is a single channel um, video, video which we see here, it's called Classes, and uh, Libihini is very interested actually in uh, acoustic pattern recognition um, and how, specifically in the UK, how this is being used to define uh, social class. So how does how do speaking patterns, accents, uh, how are they being used in order to define um, uh, social class? For example, whether you belong to the working class, uh, which is still very strong and prominent in, in the UK. Um, another work by Mushon Zer Aviv. Um, it's quite a large scale installation. It's called Normalizing. Uh, and uh, Mushon Zer Aviv, he's from Israel and he was very interested in, let's say, as you can see on the left side, <clears throat> the um, historical, um, let's say, the history of face recognition, the history of, you know, um, uh, Um, the uh, Bertillon is a French, um, I think he used to be a police officer, photographer, who invented um, the mugshot, but also the so-called portrait parlé in the 19th century in Paris. Um, and this portrait parlé, that's the speaking portrait, um, he invented it because he said um, most of the time those criminals which we arrest, they don't want to speak. And now I will make their portrait speak. So he, he, he tried to <clears throat> basically uh, describe uh, the mugshots of uh, the arrested people, uh, the people in custody, as precisely as possible in order to, you know, recognize them uh, on later uh, arrests or search warrants. And um, so this was targeted on individual people in order to recognize them at later instances. Uh, what he didn't foresee, obviously, was the later use um, by eugenics and also by uh, the Nazis who tried to describe or try to <clears throat> say that there are certain features in the face that point to a certain race and stuff like that. Um, 
in the current facial recognition systems, uh, all those traces are still present somehow. And this is what, what this project is about. Um, it's really about, and when you stand in front of this round light on the left, on the left side, you can scan your own face. I think you can even also try it online. <clears throat> and then you can, your, your face will be scanned. It will be entered into the database of faces. And you can say uh, actually which face uh, to your impression is more normal. So it's really about defining normality. And according to your, uh, your um, statements concerning other faces, your face will be grouped into this map of uh, normality. Um, we are almost at the exit, but not quite. Room six uh, also has a very poetic title. Um, first I scratched the mirror, later I crashed it. So these are all, um, we try to bring in or look at strategies, you know, how to encounter uh, artificial intelligence um, and what could be possible uh, strategies of uh, resistance to, to, uh, to these systems. Um, one of the artists who has, has been working a lot and since a very long time in the field is Adam Harvey, um, who's based in Berlin. Um, Adam Harvey, um, uh, for example, <clears throat> looked at uh, the so-called UCF selfie data set, uh, which is a huge data set used to train artificial intelligence, which consists of selfies that people uploaded on Instagram. Uh, I don't know how many tens of thousands of selfies are in this database, um, but most of the people who upload selfies, they're not aware of the fact that their data, their faces uh, is being used in order to train machines. And a lot of information we upload is used to train machines, but obviously mostly it's the it's the biometric <laughs> information that is that is quite crucial. So <clears throat> the three works by Adam Harvey we are showing. <clears throat> it is um, the exposing.ai website, which you should explore. I think there you can even research whether one of your selfies has been used in this training data set. Uh, the video we are showing um, on the right side here is actually, it's, it's a video that he generated from this selfie training data set, and which now invents, uh, quasi, uh, invents a new selfies based on this data set of non-existing people. Um, sorry. <clears throat> and... On the left side, um, it's a huge mirror that um, Adam Harvey produced in 2016, um, which is called Today's Selfie is Tomorrow's Biometric Profile. Um, and the idea is that people take selfies in front of this mirror <clears throat> and there's this, um, the, the motto, which is at the same time the title inscribed in the in the selfie that is then being uploaded to uh, to the database. <clears throat> there are also other works um, in the show <clears throat> by Jack Elvis, Sean Dockray, and Anna Anna Engelhardt which I will brief you sh briefly show you, but I don't really think that I have time to um, elaborate on them now. On the left-hand side, you see uh, Jake Elvis, the, the ZZ show, which is all about querying uh, so-called standard uh, data training sets. Uh, in the center, you see Sean Dockray's video, um, Learning from YouTube, which is, uh, all about, uh, again, auditory, uh, or let's say audible uh, artificial intelligence. He's re really interested in the moment when 
Google bought YouTube uh, in order to use <clears throat> all the videos and sounds that can be scraped from YouTube in order to train um, to train machines into recognizing auditory patterns. For example, does the sound we hear sound like criminal activity? Uh, do we hear glass breaking? Um, does the machine have to call the police because of that? On the right hand side, uh, you see a very new work by Anna Engelhardt, who's a Russian artist. And um, she looked into, let's say, the history of the use of artificial intelligence in the Soviet uh, military. Um, and um, uh, she's making public a uh, lot of interesting details. Um, and you can find it uh, on the website that she produced for this project. Um, let me, so this is the kind of the big, little bit bigger picture before we get to the exit through the gift shop. That's the title of uh, our last room. And um, we decided to <clears throat> bring together several works that kind of bring in a little bit lighter notice or that uh, bring in a lot of humor to this topic. Um, and um, there is uh, three works that we uh, that we will find um, in the room number seven, exit through the gift shop. Um, it's a piece by Stefan de Guta and Gwenola Lavagon with a very long title, which you can read. Sebastian Schmieck and Aram Bartol. <clears throat> the first project by um, Wagon and de Goutin is, uh, is really, the starting point for this project was really uh, the very interesting videos you can find on YouTube. It's uh, cats sitting on vacuum cleaning robots and driving around the apartment. Um, and um, uh, so this video, <clears throat> The video consists of found footage of cats sitting on vacuum cleaning robots being driven around. The projector itself is fixed to a vacuum cleaning robot, which is driving around the exhibition and projector is projecting images of uh, cats sitting on robots um, driving around the apartment. Um, on the right hand side, uh, you see the video of Sebastian Schmieck, um, the aesthetic of detachment. Uh, that's not the title of the work. <clears throat> the title is how to give your, be your best self some rest. And indeed, uh, Sebastian Schmieck is looking into a lot of these assistants like uh, vacuum cleaning robots, but also delivery robots. And he's performing his, himself in front of the camera, disguised as one of those vacuum cleaning robots. <clears throat> and he basically says, uh, you know, all those assistants, uh, be they material or digital, they are all strategic underperformers. So they are not as good as they could be. And maybe we should take an example and stop trying to be better and better and better. Maybe we should just underperform some in a similar way like those machines are doing. So maybe next time you write an email and then you just put, put a signature under your email saying, I'm really sorry, but this email was written by my digital assistant, you know. Um, you know, uh, still learning, you know, that's why the email looks like this. <clears throat> or you, if you don't want to uh, join people for a meeting, then you maybe can say, oh, my, uh, the smart home uh, prevented me from leaving the house because my health data were so bad and stuff like this. So, I mean, it's a really funny video and um, uh, enjoyable. Here you see the 
on the left hand side, you see Sebastian Schmieg and the vacuum cleaning robot on the right. <clears throat> and the final project um, before you leave through the real gift shop is a project by Aram Bartol. Um, uh, and here you can uh, get, you can uh, have a portrait made of you. It's not about selfies, but really it's a photo studio, as you can see. And um, a professional photo is being taken of uh, the visitors who want who want to participate in the project. And then um, as the person that is being portrayed, you can choose your favorite emoticon, which will then be used to, <clears throat> to hide your face. So the project, this the software is working with face recognition, but it's working, it's using face recognition in order to create a mask, a face mask uh, with your favorite icon. And when you get closer to the images, you can see that uh, each icon has like, this is a left eye, this is the right eye, this is the tip of the nose, this is the left part of the nose and the right, and, and so on and so on. So <clears throat> every, uh, visitor who participates on the project or every visitor who comes to see the exhibition can take a free artwork uh, home, which is really a gift. Um, and uh, yeah, looking at the clock, um, I think I should come to an end. Um, there's a, a publication available, uh, which is uh, uh, online, uh, which is available as a free PDF, which you can download uh, on our website. There you find more pictures and uh, lots of texts about the works, but also an introduction by the curators and a text by Adam Harvey. And if you happen to be around in Germany, maybe for Documenta, uh, maybe you can uh, drop in and uh, Yes, have a look at, at this exhibition, which is uh, quite an experience, especially with those mirrors. Sometimes I really, me knowing the space really well, sometimes I almost run into mirrors. <laughs> Thank you very much. And I think I can now stop sharing the screen. Yes, great. Thank you so much, Inke. And it was really interesting to to see the exhibition uh, through your presentations. It's really fascinating. Um, Dalina, maybe one one uh, hint. There's three people in the waiting room, I think. Yes, uh, uh, Adriana will let them okay. in now because we will we'll invite now um, the project fellows of Ethica Lab second round. Okay. These young people who were selected to take part in the uh, project and to collaborate with their uh, colleagues in creation of new projects. So we, in the time of um, them entering and starting the discussion, I would like to briefly like um, uh, share my um, uh, impression of this show. Uh, first of all, I really love the concept. I find it really interesting how you actually refer to the artificial intelligence <laughs> as a house of mirror. Actually, I do understand your concern as a curator and people, a person from the creative field that um, I've noticed also um, other colleagues uh, really not willing to use artificial intelligence uh, as a term. Uh, they also prefer to use uh, rather machine learning or as you mentioned, pattern recognition um, that uh, yeah, it's understandable attitude towards because basically, as you can see from this exhibition, um, you're quite critical towards uh, the issues that are really raised from algorithmic, um, uh, really difference in our lives. And I was wondering because when you start uh, presenting the show, you said that uh, the the project was willing to to show these extremes uh, from uh, fears to hopes, but what I've noticed basically, there were mostly this critical uh, notion and maybe the fears or not, okay, precisely the fears, but maybe the concerns that the artist has. 
and um, here I recall actually your text uh, that um, you published to this uh, publication. It's not visible because it's the same color as my background. But um, after the first uh, round of the project at Labs, we decided to make a publication in order to present the six projects created by the project fellows of the last year. And also we invited uh, text contributors and among them was Inke. And she wrote this very interesting uh, essay uh, entitled uh, um, we show uh, so let me check again not to <laughs> we better teach uh, it some basic human rights and there you also show your um, critical uh, notion towards this and also uh, you quoted um, um, uh, artificial stupidity this term that uh, he to share uh, the artist also used in uh, in her text. Uh, so yeah, it was interesting to see how how you um, really uh, present these uh, artistic uh, positions towards this. But I was wondering, is there any other projects? I mean, um, besides this one that you presented, that are maybe in honor to uh, artificial intelligence, to algorithm, because you know, when uh, the producers of these applications and other uh, uh, products using uh, algorithms and algorithmic systems are, are presenting them to the market, they always promise us as a customers, as, as users, to, to, to better our lives. I mean, to make uh, like a, a gift to humanity, to, to improve our lives, our way of entertainment, communication, healthcare, etc. So is it really that bad? I mean, shall we be rather skeptical towards this or there are also some interesting, uh, I mean, and more positive occurrences of that. What's your personal uh, well, yeah, I can I can expand a little bit on this. Um, first of all, uh, I don't think I'm critical. I think I'm a realist. Um, uh, concerning the concerns, um, what I tried to say in the beginning in the introduction is that there are really <clears throat> extremely dystopian views of artificial intelligence. Uh, artificial super intelligence is going to take over world power, world domination, or there's extremely positive uh, utopian um, engineers dreams. And, and so for me, these are really the two extremes that we try to kind of navigate in this, in this labyrinth. Um, and, um, for me, for example, I I think there is you know this this topic uh, this this um, ability of recognizing patterns. This is something that artificial intelligence can do much 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 better, much more effectively than any human, and it can do so in big data. Uh, there's I think a very very interesting very positive. Um, uh, use of artificial intelligence or, or let's say pattern recognition in, um, for example, uh, recognizing cancer, you know, and, and at a very early stage. Um, so I, I'm not uh, uh, I'm not concerned or critical by profession, let's say. I think there's I'm very interested in those developments, but uh, I'm all, I also became, the more I read about it, the more I became critical and concerned, um, you know, by, by uh, reading stories of, you know, what I also wrote in, in your publication, this, um, this digital assistant, Tai, uh, by Microsoft, uh, who was supposed to learn, you know, from the users and who was supposed to emulate a 16 year old. Uh, and then obviously the trolls came in and they taught the artificial 16 year old how to see the world. And then it, it turned, Tai became a fascist and Microsoft um, had to turn off the system after a very short amount of time. Uh, or, you know, other cases where, you know, um, 
uh, for example, uh, Asian users of um, this unlocking option on smartphone uh, were not able to use it because their face was not recognized by the system because of the Asian features. Or um, uh, image recognition systems that uh, rec uh, don't recognize uh, uh, black faces uh, as humans and stuff like this. So, so this is obviously coming in because the data sets are so biased, or let's say the, the data sets which are training the artificial intelligence systems are, uh, yeah, bias they are they are lopsided you know there's there's information missing that's why the system can only reproduce what is what it has been taught and i think this is a this is a problem especially when you think that so many people think of ai as being a neutral system an objective system oh yeah yeah it's done by ai okay so nobody is really um, questioning where, who is training these systems on, on the basis of which data. Um, there's another case that comes to my mind. Uh, this was, uh, it's again, a case from the US. Um, it's about um, a kidney transplant um, or organ transplants uh, where they also used one of the a system based on AI and the system systematically denied organ donations to black patients. And if you don't if you don't question these systems, then you you know these these trained systems will prolong inequalities from the past to the future because they are based also on statistical data um, and um, this is really a problem i think that's why i'm so interested by uh, you know the question of ethics i think we have to understand how uh, let's say what those uh, systems are trained on and what are they based on? And that's why, you know, I was even claiming that you, we should teach it some basic human rights. Or uh, as somebody said on a panel, I was participating on the weekend, uh, at least these AI systems should have internalized our constitution. So Absolutely. I do agree with you, <laughs> totally. And um, of course, yes, uh, biases are really one of the most, uh, um, say, concerned fields that we are all dealing with. And I, I can share with you and with our uh, audience that uh, the project fellows um, um, are really a focus on this also in their projects in uh, one way or another. They are dealing with this issue of how uh, really, the biases are producing this also manipulated <laughs> um, interventions and interactions among us. I mean, uh, really dealing with algorithms. And uh, here is interesting, can we also have one question from um, the audience? What was the reaction of the public uh, to this exhibition? I mean, do we have a chance to, to, to get feedback from the people? How do they uh, see and feel this? Uh, um, uh, projects that you presented and what's what's the what's the feedback on that? Mm, well, first of all, I can say that um, this exhibition is extremely popular, mm -hmm. uh, which is great. Ob obviously, we have uh, lots of visitors, and um, we kind of recovered, you know, after all these times of closure of uh, during the pandemic. Um, and what is also interesting, we have lots of uh, students who come from universities, you know, from seminars. Um, we've never had to give so many uh, guided tours for uh, student groups, you know, which is quite remarkable. And concerning the, the reactions or the feedback I get, I mean, it's totally, it's super biased. You know, what I hear is super biased, obviously, because people mostly tell me when they like the, the exhibition. Um, but uh, so far, I haven't heard or 
uh, read any kind of um, uh, huge criticism or something, but a lot of people uh, sent me like uh, commentaries, like they they were very impressed and um, and so on. Um, but for some people as well, uh, it's, it's similar to what you said in the beginning. It's like uh, I'm much I'm much too critical. <laughs> <laughs> I shouldn't be so concerned. And I always say like, no, of course, we all should be concerned. I mean. Yes, definitely. And uh, another question also, I just noticed in the uh, YouTube channel, uh, are they, um, what sorry observation, were there any rooms that were more interesting, interesting to the audience than the others? I mean, how do the people, um, reacted on the different rooms and topics that you point uh, in these uh, seven sections in the show? Well, there's, um, the works really require different kinds of uh, time, uh, dedication, dedication time-wise. Uh, you know, for example, the, the chess board, which you can play with uh, RYBN. Um, uh, this takes, you know, 20, 30 minutes to complete all the 12 tables which is fun as well, um, but also, you know, you learn something about the history of automation or the, the present and the future of automation. Um, then of course, there's videos that kind of, um, that, uh, uh, that get your attention in a very different way. So I can't really say this. Well, I mean, Jake Elvis, the ZZ show is extremely popular because you can, you know, play your favorite song. It's interactive and it's also a lot of fun involved in this exhibition, which um, I personally like a lot because um, uh, it's a good way of, um, of selling a topic that might be considered critical or, you know, uh, not so bright, let's say. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And I really like uh, the, the last uh, room, the last chapter of this exhibition <laughs> that uh, really finished with this uh, great sense of humor and really more like uh, ironic uh, notion towards this otherwise very serious issues. So it's it's great how you decided to, to organize, I mean, this um, exhibition um, design and rooms. Uh, all right, so I think that Livia asked uh, uh, the chance to, to join yeah. the discussion. Uh, I Can wanted to, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, I wanted actually to talk about the first part that uh, she mentioned, that the IE is better at pattern recognition and how people actually think that IE does it all and should be better. So the question would be if it's better at pattern recognition, why don't we start teaching it and using it from there? I mean, patterns are in different guises and can be more simply or easier translated into, let's say, something that a machine would understand. You have patterns in graphs, you have patterns in numbers. Um, why would you start with something like complex? Just show it an image and hope it's going to recognize the item there. Why not start from smaller samples, then teach it gradually so you can reduce the chance of error in this case because if i might continue the medical application of that with the cancer it's also related to, to having like ct scans x-rays and so forth analyzed by doctors which recognize this spot is a cancerous cell formation whatever and the ie is trained on that data set but it's still based on humans if we would go for something more basic, let's say, like an EK, um, EKG, electrocardiogram, or something that goes in numbers, values, graphs, which are also medical data, which can be procured, uh, those patterns would be easier to be seen and later on to be correlated, like you have an anomaly in your pattern and see what happens then. That's why I, what I don't get in the medical development part mm. with my... Mm -hmm. Well, I think um, I would agree with you, um, but still, I think the problem is not so much um, focusing on less complex uh, issues and more complex issues, but it's really the, um, the interpretation 
of the data that comes with it. Um, uh, yeah, obviously, I mean, if you if you use it uh, to interpret to find patterns in mathematical data, obviously, uh, should be no problem. But I think the next step could be problematic anyway, because um, as soon as you as you involve um, interpretation, which is something human, I would say, uh, I guess then you have lots of moments where bias could enter, possibly. Well, the thing with bias um, is we had a very interesting talk about this, is that nothing can escape it because even if you don't have biased data, let's suppose you have the cleanest non-biased data existing, the program you use it to interpret it is written or programmed by someone which in turn has biases. So then you will have to learn to deal with biases, like, yeah. I don't know, <laughs> the particles that moves when you hit the air or something like that. It, it can't be Brownian movement. You can't stop it. It just exists. You just have to interpret it out. Yes, I think it's it's always good to be aware of the fact that uh, bias might be everywhere or is everywhere. Um, but uh, it might also be good to um, to uh, proactively uh, change some of those systems. Like for example, um, Adam Harvey, uh, it's the the artist who already worked a lot and for a long time with. Uh, um, face recognition and who looked into those into the fact that you know those uh, that Instagram was scraped that selfies on Instagram was scraped in order to uh, enter this training data set with which then artificial intelligence was trained and um, um, a lot of people became aware of this and they said this is not you know people don't know that their faces are being used for, for these purposes. And um, there was quite a huge public outcry concerning this. And so a lot of companies have stopped doing this, uh, which is quite, quite interesting. And it's, um, I think, quite a positive development that, uh, you know, especially those private companies, they simply cannot, you know, um, um, act like this, you know. Um, yeah. Thanks. <laughs> All right. Um, so I will invite also the other um, project fellows who have joined the uh, Zoom call to, to switch on their cameras so that we can see their faces and also maybe to take the chance and to ask uh, Inke their questions. In the meantime, I, I, I was wondering, Kinke, have you noticed, I mean, uh, the differences uh, in the um, maybe uh, audience reactions towards this uh, uh, show from the generation point of view? I mean, how do the students and uh, young uh, people that you mentioned uh, have visited uh, the, the exhibition reacted and uh, let's say more like mid uh, <laughs> age people also uh, approach this and how do they probably uh, refer to that because they are different uh, uh, um, uh, usage of, of uh, electronic devices and algorithmic uh, implemented in this by the youngsters and uh, uh, the uh, people in, in uh, on different age, I mean, like uh, mid age. And what about the show? I mean, how do they probably also differently reacted on that? Well, um, I'm not there every day. I don't really conduct a kind of uh, mm. survey, <laughs> which I possibly should do. Um, you should, um, I guess, ask the people who are at our um, at our welcome desk or at the information uh, desk uh, who could tell us more about this. But uh, in general, what I noticed is that obviously young people are more, um, of, of course, they're more, uh, easily acquainted with, you know, let's say the kinds of technologies you talk about, um, or the the devices you use, or artists use in in exhibitions, or that are depicted in the videos. 
Um, but also what I notice, and maybe it's only a thesis, I would have to really uh, get some more data on this. Um, maybe sometimes older generations are a bit more uh, politically aware. Uh, maybe because they know, for example, in Germany in the 1980s, we had the so-called Volkszählung. You know, we had this, uh, there was the, the intention to count the population and to make a huge survey of, you know, um, how many people live in this country, how old are they, where do they live, and so on and so on. So there was a huge public outcry. I still remember this. I was a child. I was a small kid when this happened. But I remember this huge uh, public outcry and the protests against this. Um, and, you know, maybe older generations kind of can relate to these kinds of issues more easily, let's say. But this is just a, a theory. And I think the best thing would be if both generations would work together, then we would be like, this would be perfect. <laughs> yes, definitely. Uh, all right. Do we have now uh, questions from the other uh, project fellows who have joined the uh, Zoom call? Mm -hmm. Let me check uh, the YouTube channel because I'm not really following this uh, all the time. May May I interrupt you to ask one right question? Sure, Hello. sure. Go ahead. Yes, I have raised my hand, but maybe it wasn't visible, <laughs> so I took the initiative to, to speak. Yes. Um, good evening. Thank you very much for the presentation. It was uh, really interesting, uh, especially, I have to say, to our team, because we aim to construct an exhibition uh, with different uh, installations as well. Uh, we aim uh, to focus on the discriminatory or let's say generally biased aspect of uh, AI uh, and especially towards women. Mm -hmm. This is our goal. Uh, so your uh, house uh, would be really a paradigm, a symbol for us. We will take everything you uh, talked about into consideration. <laughs> um, that's why I wanted to ask a really practical um, question. Um, you presented the, all the sections let's say all the separate rooms with a specific order. Uh, I would like to know if um, this is, let's say a symbolic route or if it's possible for the visitors to visit them separately on their own will. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very good question. Uh, and I can tell you, no, it's the only way through the exhibition. Usually I never, never ever work like this. I always work with a maximum open space. And I, I hate nothing more than having, a, having to follow a path, a narrative. But in this case, it totally made sense. Um, also, you know, everything is quite packed and it's quite full. So uh, we, we managed to bring in like 21 uh, installations uh, into the exhibition. And, we really decided from the beginning on to really use this metaphor of the house of mirrors um, and really to create this kind of, you know, I mean, still on the pictures, it looks quite spacious, which it is still somehow, but um, to create this kind of narrow situation of the house of mirrors. And in a house of mirrors, there's only one way. It, it tries to, you know, to uh, confuse you, but uh, there is one way through the House of Mirrors uh, and sometimes you're blocked by an image of yourself or you see a window or you see a you know, distorted uh, uh, self, but there's only one way out. And so that's what we did in this exhibition. And you know, um, the order could be a bit different, um, but the exit through the gift shop for us, it was important to have it at the end, obviously, uh, stealing a film title by Banksy, obviously, um, or on Banksy. Um, and for us, it was just important to have, to address those different issues and concerns and, and topics. 
the the order itself is not so important um the first room was important to have it at the beginning and the last room was important so the first room is this engineer's dream everything can be automated and the machines are going to take over the work and we will be free <laughs> so you know to uh, to put people in this kind of mood, let's say, and then gradually uh, making the visitors think about but what actually would that mean? So I think the first room, the engineer's dream is set and the exit through the gift shop and the rest is kind of, it could be put in a different order. Um, yeah. But thank you for this question, a really good question. Thank you as well. It was uh, the, the answer was enlightening. <laughs> Good, thank you, Anastasia. Um, any other questions? Because I check we don't have uh, in the YouTube chat uh, more questions. And if you uh, or Project Five don't want to, I mean, don't have anything else to ask, uh, Livia, okay. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to say something about the exhibition. I'm from the architecture background, so I couldn't help it. Uh, you know, you could you could uh, keep the starting point and the ending point the same, and the um, other rooms around could have been left open and then tracked the path that the people would have taken. So you've seen, let's say, which part influences or interest in them more. So you would have gathered somehow like data about their opinion indirectly by the path they would have chosen. Because the first turn, let's say after the first room would be, I don't know if you want left, right or front. But then if you had information about what's following next, you'll be, mm, I don't know, I, that one sounds more interesting. <laughs> so you could have had like an user experience feedback directly by their exploring. And because of course, in all the museums I've seen, People have some, usually the bad habit of returning, like I liked the exhibition in that part. I'm going a bit back to snap a picture, see it again. So it could have been interactive also in this way, besides the per se installations. So yes, thank you know. for thank you for this observation. Um obviously uh we uh, certain works do have certain requirements, um, and so we were definitely not entirely free to position any room in any space. So um, some works could be positions in a, in a more open space, some other works, for example, the, the VO, the vehicle operator, uh, had to be screened in a, in a closed space. So. Um, this really, we had to fit the exhibition in existing um, spaces as well. And um, concerning the surveillance of visitors, we decided against this. Um, we discussed this, uh, but we very consciously decided uh, against this because we simply didn't want to, to repeat the, the this, uh, let's say, quantification. Um, uh, thing and it for me it also would not have been so meaningful uh, to say it directly um yeah no we decided uh, very early on we, dis we discussed this uh, kind of uh, surveillance uh, thing but um we decided against this So tell me more about uh, about your project. I'm so interested in the link you draw between artificial intelligence and ethics. Um, my uh, our teams. Yes. So, okay. Um, in our teams, uh, I was actually interested about the medical data because we decided to use AI to interpret a pattern in uh, blood sugar. Uh, I am the diabetic, I have a continuous monitoring system, and uh, the data output is basically a graph, which actually, if you start reading it, actually reading it, you're looking, you can start to see patterns as a human. If you're feeling sick, low, 
peels, different contributions, which can actually foretell things to come because your body reacts faster, but no one notices. And since people usually don't check every day your past week, month, or and so forth, uh, we consider it might actually be of great help to bring mm -hmm. this closer to the people. And not necessarily like an all-knowing eye, but more like to warn you that there is a difference, to make you search for, to make you improve yourself, actually. Because I have lots of people that I know that simply, okay, I just read my info, I know what to do for the moment, mm -hmm. but they can't foresee the events that are going to come, which would be very useful. So we decided that this would be a very useful application, and that's what we are trying to develop. And of course, we had the um, ethical debates. First, the problem was, of course, with the data. Who owns data? How do you get the data? Mm -hmm. um, is it okay to use it? But this was kind of solved by the fact that it's your data. It's actually collected by another company, and you do whatever you want with the results. So no one can blame you for using it to compose music if you want it. And um, that was one of the first steps. The second step, let's say, was the ethical part of using it as in the human part. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. we decided there is a problem, given the fact, let's say, the problem between humans and humans, humans and themselves, and humans and I. Because you have distrust towards this new scientific thing. Nobody knows what it does, how it does, and why it does it says what it says. Mm -hmm. You have the mistrust with other people because people are like, what are you, a robot? Why are you using that? Can't you just eat without having to think how many carbs you're ingesting? And of course, problems with yourself, because usually small children more likely, but also adults are like, either I'm sick of tired, I just want to eat a burger without thinking before what's going to happen three hours after eating it. <laughs> or the small kids when they're like playing around and we know what happens when kids get bullied. So by making this app more friendly and actually giving them like a friend to play it. why not like a small pet small creature which you it's your friend you know what it does mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we are hoping to make this a little easier psychologically speaking and also a little easier biologically speaking why not because you have problems reading it i have people at the hospital where i do my checkups where we're looking and what does this thing do <laughs> and how does it work and mm -hmm. It's a bit difficult to comprehend it because, uh, well, it's data. People don't, normal people or people who are not necessarily in domains that use graphs, math, and so forth, are not really used to looking at graphs and said, this curve looks a bit flat and I think it's going down too fast. <laughs> and I think this happened for a week. I wonder why. They don't usually put those questions they don't do it usually, so it's kind of normal. But uh, I think we are kind of like brokers, you know, when they're monitoring stock exchange, but we're monitoring more important stuff like our own life. Mm -hmm. so, um, that's what we are intending to do in our project. Great. Uh, sounds, sounds very useful. <laughs> yeah, it's a project of... Uh, creating an application, mm -hmm. but basically more, uh, most of the, uh, we have four teams this year and they were uh, formed during this idea ton event that we had a chance to, to happen uh, in Sofia in person because last year uh, edition was entirely online due to the pandemic. It was mm -hmm. impossible to even think of uh, uh, really bringing people together. But this time we had this um, really opportunity to invite the pre-selected uh, participants to, to join this uh, meeting in Sofia. And then they were really working hard to, <laughs> to find common interests and topics they want to explore. And then they formed these four teams. And uh, uh, they're more... Um, focus on research, but also creating something out of this research that we are going to present uh, at the end of the project um, in mid-November. And it will be 
again, virtual events, but that will be the forum that will really um, give a chance to the project teams to present their uh, collaborative work. And they're really, really interesting. Maybe if Anastasia also want to share about their uh, um, topic, because it's also very interesting. Okay. Of course, of course, it would be my pleasure. Um, as I talked to you a little bit about before, uh, our team focused on the question whether AI actually enforces, reinforces, or let's say promotes discrimination against women. Mm -hmm. And if, an, if that's the case, how can this problem be solved? Uh, can it be solved via AI as well? Um, we would like to, let's say, examine both sides of the coin. The, the negative one, but uh, construct also a positive one. Um, so uh, taking into consideration that art and ethics can always be a solution, um, we, we thought of developing an uh, art installation uh, in the form of labyrinth uh, with different parts uh, that would uh, show different uh, ways that AI actually uh, promotes uh, discrimination against women in order uh, for this part to raise awareness mainly. Uh, and in the end, also include some ways that uh, will, um, uh, will show how AI can be used as a tool uh, in order to give agency to women to raise their voices to uh, to be able to, through AI, to establish themselves mm -hmm. and to fight uh, actually uh, towards the discrimination which AI also um, supports. Mm -hmm. These are, well, let's say, our two main goals. I hope we will make it and it will be visible to, uh, the, to other people as well, to the visitors and to uh, the public who is going to this art is this art let's say um exhibition is going to be presented to great wow i wish you good luck uh, with thank this project you. thank you very much okay thank you anastasia uh tamara remind me are you a part of the uh, these two projects yes you work together yes yes i'm with livia uh we are working together on uh, the diabetic yes. project yes right. Okay, and uh, we have also uh, Tia, but I'm not sure if she was really uh, in this Zoom uh, uh, meeting, but she was not really active. So anyway, uh, so we are... Sorry, I met it myself. Approaching the end of this uh, meeting. Uh, uh, so I would like to... to uh, Thank you, Inke, for this very interesting presentation and uh, the, the chance you gave us to really to experience this uh, exhibition virtually. I, I truly hope I'll have the chance to come and see it. But anyway, we, we really had this uh, opportunity to, to go deeper into this. And I think it's really an um, interesting showcase of some really urgent and very relevant questions that the artists uh, really put and uh, provoke some uh, awareness and discussion towards these ethical um, concerns and implications. Uh, great, thank you so much for your time in, uh, in the just talk and we, yes, we keep in touch and follow the other projects of uh, HMKV, yes. Thank you so much uh, for inviting me and uh, please download the free PDF. Uh, it's a beautiful publication and there's also a very short video. Um, I think we wanted to post it in the in the chat. Um, short video. Oh, I still have the link. Huh. Um, it's a twelve minute video about the the exhibition where you can see also the two other curators talking about the show. So, not okay. only me. <laughs> Great. Okay, we can maybe then add it later because this um, uh, um, live stream will be, uh, it was recorded and then will be later uploaded on the project website. 
so people can see it also uh, later on. And they can also download the PDF of this publication that I tried to show. <laughs> uh, I mean, we have a printed version, but uh, you can find the PDF uh, version on the Ethical Labs uh, project. So you can also take a chance and uh, and read, uh, read the articles there. Great. Thank you so much. Have a nice evening. You too.